But are there hidden messages in the Bible? There are many scholars that say there are no such things. And uh, unfortunately, the Bible is, uh, that, 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 is, that, that uh, view is brutally assaulted by the facts. Uh, Proverbs 25.2 says, It is the glory of God to conceal a thing and the honor of kings to search out a matter. God has put treasures here for our learning if we'll take the trouble to discover them. I want to give you a riddle. Who is the oldest man in the Bible? Anyone? Methuselah. Methuselah. You're right on. Exactly. Yet he died before he lived 969 years. Yet he died before his father. Yeah. Okay, you looked ahead. All right. Okay. Oh, yeah, you're right. Everybody forgets who his father was. His father was Enoch. And uh, Enoch didn't die. He was, excuse the expression, raptured. But at, he, at the age of 65, Enoch had an experience of some kind. Because from that day on, it says he walked with God. And he does over 300 years. He lived to be 365. So at the age of 65, something happened that caused him for the next 300 years, the rest of his life, to walk with God. Now, his, his son is named Methuselah. The name Methuselah comes from a root that means death. Muth means death. It occurs 125 times in the Old Testament. And the verb shalak, which means to bring or send forth, that comes up 60 times in the Old Testament, usually to bring forth a judgment. So the name Methuselah, the combination of those two roots, means his death shall bring. You say, boy, that's kind of a strange name for a kid. You see, one of the things you need to understand, we'll go into this when we get to chapter 6, the flood of Noah did not come as a surprise. It had been preached on for four generations. They knew a flood, that those that were listening knew a judgment was coming. Enoch was given a prophecy. He's given several. I'll talk about another one he got too. But he, he's given a prophecy that as long as his son is alive, the judgment of the flood would be withheld. So he named him, his death shall bring. That's a pretty weird thing. Can you imagine girls raising that kid? Every time he caught a cold, the neighborhood would go into panic, right? <laughs> Methuselah lives 187 years. He has a son by the name of Lamech. We'll talk more about him in a minute. And Lamech lives 182 years, and he has a son by the name of Noah. How many of you have heard of Noah? About 80%. Well, we've got a problem. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. And, of course, Noah, it's in his 600th year that the flood comes. If you do your arithmetic, you'll discover that Methuselah, the year that Methuselah dies is the year the flood came. His life was a prophecy. His life was a prophecy of mercy. If his life is a prophecy of mercy, it's not accidental that his life is the longest lifetime in the Bible. Because it, 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 the point that God is making that he has, he is a merciful God. His mercy extends beyond that which you would expect. But it's also finite. There is a point at which even that has its limits. So I want to talk a little bit. In Genesis chapter 5, we're going to encounter a genealogy of ten people. Adam, Seth, Enosh, Kenan, Mahalalel, Yared, Enoch, Methuselah, Lamech, and Noah. Ten guys. If there's all this meaning tucked away behind the name of Methuselah, what about the rest of these guys? Now, we have a problem here because there are many, very few people have the resources to try to unravel proper names. If you look at Strong's Concordance, these typical concordances, they don't deal with proper names. We don't ourselves translate proper names. My formal legal name is Charles. What does Charles mean? No one's quite sure. They try to link it to Charlemagne. or they, There's all kinds of conjectures in the little pamphlets you might find. But they don't know. We, this, it's been lost in antiquity. Whatever your name means, some of you probably have names that which we, we don't know what they mean. In Hebrew, all the words in Hebrew are built of three-letter roots. And the roots have meaning. In fact, I won't take the time tonight, but it's worth your while to discover that there are 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. And if you find how those letters were written before the Babylonian captivity, they were written in a little different way, but in a way that represented something visual. And, and if you learn what those letters mean, you can interpret about 80% of the Hebrew. The University of, uh, the, uh, University of Arizona's Hebrew department pointed this out to me. 
came, uh, uh, they pointed out to me that they've discovered that if they teach the kids how the Hebrew was originally written and learn what those letters mean, then they can read about 80% of the Hebrew. Because the Hebrew alphabet is not just phonetic, like most alphabets, it's also uh, carries, the, uh, carries, it's concept driven. Uh, uh, Aleph, the first letter of the alphabet, is the first letter, so it means first or leader, right? Aleph, it's, it's like a, well, it's similar to, it actually is written like a, a sort of like, a, it's what we, like an ox's head, a hor long horn, uh, horns with a skull. So it meant strength or leader, that's what Aleph, Aleph means. Bet was like a little line with a teepee on it. It later becomes our B, but it, uh, uh, bet in the Hebrew uh, is, uh, it meant house. So if you Aleph and a bet, it's the leader of the house. Aleph, bet, ab. It's the name for father. You take he, which is a breath, which means spirit. You put that in the middle of the word. It's the essence of that word. If you take a he and put it between the Aleph and the bet, you have the spirit, the essence of the father. It's ahab, the word for love. Love is the essence of the father. See, what I'm getting at is you can build the meaning of the words if you understand the meaning of the letters. In English or most other languages, the letters are strictly phonetic. And you have to put them together and then learn what that word means, you see. But the Hebrew uh, is built from roots. And so uh, to track some, if you're trying to figure out what proper names mean, you've got to get into the Hebrew roots. And there are sources for that, but they're usually hard to come by. But let's take a look and see what we can put together with the genealogy here. Genesis chapter 5, verse 1, and this is the book of the generations of Adam. In other words, this is the genealogy, the book of the generations of Adam. In the day that God created man, in the likeness of God, made he him. Male and female created he them and blessed them and called their name Adam. Adam's not the guy, it's the combination. They're one flesh. You can get into a whole thing there, but another day. In the day in which they were created, and Adam lived 130 years and begot a son in his own likeness after his image and called his name Seth. I want you to know something. Adam, both Mr. and Mrs. Adam, were in the likeness of God. He created them directly. They are sons of God. Bar, Elohim, and, uh, and the woman too. Um, Seth is not a son of God. He's a son of Adam. You and I are sons of Adam. We're not sons of God unless we've been born again. John chapter 1, verse 11 and 12. Jesus, speaking of Jesus, He came unto His own, and His own received Him not. But as many as received Him, to them gave He the power to become the sons of God. That's not just a spiritual phrase. It's a very definitive statement that's explained in chapter 3 of John. Being born again is not just a, a, a spiritual idiom. It's a very, very important event. You're a new creation in Christ. But let's move on, moving on here. Okay, he called his name Seth. Okay, now what does Seth mean? Did we remember what Seth meant? What did Eve tell you Seth meant? Appointed. Appointed. Good for you. Adam is easy. Adam means man. I could have asked you that. Most kids, Adam means man. The days of Adam after he begotten Seth were 800 years. He begot sons and daughters. And all the days that Adam lived were 930 years and he died. And Seth lived 105 years and begot Enos. Now, Seth means appointed, as, as Eve explained back in chapter 4, verse 25. Seth lived after he begot Enos 807 years and begot sons and daughters. And all the days of Seth were 912 years and he died. You know, many people who read 5, many of the commentators, you go through 5, all they see is he died, so and so, and he died. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a book of death. No, that's because they haven't done the homework to translate it. See, you and I have it all translated except for the proper names. Seth, Enosh, those are untrans they're transliterated. They're English approximations of how they're pronounced, but they're untranslated. We're going to try to translate them. We've got, we got Adam, Seth, let's take Enosh. What does Enosh mean? The, it, it comes from a root which means mortal, frail, or miserable. It's a, it's a, it comes from the root Anash, which is a root which means incurable. It's usually used of a wound or grief, or woe, or sickness, or wickedness. It's, uncur it's incurable. Let's call it mortal. Enosh lived 90 years and begot Canaan. And this is an unfortunate translation because Canaan is actually Aramaic. The Hebrew would be Kenan. But anyway, the, the Enosh lived after he begot Kenan uh, 815 years and he begot sons and daughters. And all the days of Enosh were 905 years and he died. Canaan, which can mean sorrow or dirge or elegy. Pretty grim words, actually. And can, you ma can you imagine uh, raising that kid? Uh, choosing up basketball teams. Hey, sorrow, you're on our team. It doesn't work, does it? <laughs> well, you neither is Edosh. You're incurable, but you're on our side. Anyway. 
And Kenan uh, uh, lived 70 years and begot Mahalalel. Now, I assume that he got tired of he and his father and his grandfather, these, these grim names. So when he got his son, he gave him a mouthful. But boy, it's a great name, Mahalalel. After, I'll come in a minute. After he lived, he got Mahalalel 840 years, begot sons and daughters, and the days of Kenan were 910 years, and he died. Mahalalel, it's, it's root two words, Mahalal, which means blessed or praised one, and El, which is the name of God. So Mahalalel means the blessed God or the praised God. A mouthful, but a great name. Can you imagine having the name of God in your, in your handle? That's pretty good. Mahalalel uh, lived 65 years and begot Yared. And uh, Mahalalel lived after he begot Yared 830 years and begot sons and daughters. And all the days of Mahalalel were 890 and five years, and he died. Now, Yared is an easy one because Yared is a Hebrew verb meaning shall come down. Now, when you get to Genesis 6, you learn about some strange things that came down upon the earth. And it could be, it's conjectured by some, that that stuff may have started in the days of this kid. And that's why he was named Yared, shall come down. That may be prophetic. We don't know. But anyway, he's called Yared. And Yared lived 60 and two years and begot Enoch. And he, and he lived after he begot Enoch 800 years and begot sons and daughters. And all the days of Yared were 960 and two years. And he died. Now, we have Enoch. We've talked about Enoch. This is one of the most interesting guys in the Bible, by the way. Um, now we have Enoch. We've talked about Enoch. This is one of the most interesting guys in the Bible, by the way. Um, but his name means, it's, a, it's an academic term, meaning commencement or teaching. Teaching, we'll say, Enoch. It's interesting, the oldest prophecy in the Bible uttered by a prophet is by Enoch. It's, you'll find it not in, in the Torah, you'll find it in the book of Jude, the one just before Revelation. The brother of Jesus Christ, he wrote an epistle. He says, and Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, he's talking about the end times, saying, behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment on all, upon all, to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Seems to have a vocabulary restriction here on part of the translators, but anyway... Uh, Ungodly shows up four times in one sentence. But, but the point is, this is an interesting prophecy. It's a prophecy of the second coming of Jesus Christ that was uttered before the flood of Noah. I think that's kind of interesting. It, it tells us four things. We know that the Lord's coming is sure. and It's absolutely certain. It's even mentioned, in, 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 in a sense, in the past tense. And that's exactly the way the Bible often talks about it. Even Revelation 19 is in, in the past tense thing. See, so it's like history. Can't you? Nothing can change it. Because, it, you know, Philip in the he's going to subdue all things to himself. And the second thing we know, we know who will accompany him. His holy myriads. And who are they? They find the myriads in other passages. Zechariah 14.5, Revelation 19.14, Daniel 7.10, and so forth. And uh, Moses talks about in Deuteronomy 33, the, the myriads of his holy ones. Uh, angels in the sense of Acts 7.53, Galatians 3.19. And Christ's return in Matthew 25, 31. All the, all the holy angels will come with him. And yet the believers also, according to Colossians 3, 4 and uh, 1 Thessalonians 3, 13. And uh, third thing we know from this prophecy is that we know the purpose of his coming. And uh, both the first and the last prophecy in the Bible deal, focuses on the second coming of Jesus Christ. And he'll come to bring judgment. And uh, according to Hebrews 9, 26. And uh, so forth. And... Uh, and we know the result of his coming, of course, and that will be that, uh, that uh, he will, uh, uh, all the ungodly will be convicted of all the works of ungodliness and so forth and so on. Pretty straightforward. Um, all the books open and uh, the final judgment. I might mention, by the way, there are three groups of people that face the flood of Noah. We're going to talk about this when we get to chapter 6 next time. Those that perished in the flood, of course, those that were preserved through the flood, and those that were removed prior to the flood. And I'm going to suggest to you that Enoch was not post-flood or mid-flood. He was pre-flood. Okay. You, did you, that, that went by you? Okay, sorry. It's interesting, at the depth of apostasy, we have Enoch, who is translated, that was midway between Adam and Abraham. Elijah was translated midway between Abraham and Christ both ministering in a nadir of apostasy, both translated. Kind of interesting. And the church will probably be translated at the nadir of apostasy, which we're rapidly plunging to. 
when we've got one of the most conservative channels on television doing a week-long thing this week of the war on Christianity, the reality of the war against Christians. That you, you, you know, that, uh, anyway. Verse 21, and Enoch lived 65 years and begot Methuselah. And Enoch walked with God after he begot Methuselah 300 years and he begot sons and daughters. And all the days of Enoch were 365 years. And Enoch walked with God and he was not. God took him. So I'll call that being raptured. In Hebrews 11.4, we looked at that. Hebrews 11.5 says, By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him and before his translation he had this testimony that he pleased God. Oh, if that could be said of us. If we somehow, through intense prayer and commitment and resolve, could just walk so to please God. Enoch walked with God. That was not a casual th stroll. That lasted 300 years. And... Uh, that included, according to Amos 3, involved agreement, surrender, and witness. Those are three important things. That privilege that Enoch had is available to you and me. Galatians 2.6, Galatians 5, I mean Colossians 2.6, Galatians 5.25, 2 Corinthians 5.7. You and I should be aspiring to walk with God, to please Him. And I think that would make us eligible for rapture too, wouldn't it? Wouldn't that be exciting? An interesting parallel there. Methuselah, as we've talked about, it means his death shall bring. I've talked about that. He lived, 180, he lived 187 years, begot Lamech. Then he lived, after he begot Lamech, 782 years, begot sons and daughters. All the days of Methuselah were 960 and 9 years, and he died. A lot of people have trouble with these long longevities, by the way, but you'll notice that they'll gradually decline. Um, uh, there's all kinds of scientific conjectures as to why. Some of this has to do with radiation. Some of it might have the decline of the human genome. Um, and so forth. Uh, we are all victims of these little diagrams in National Geographic and what have you of the ascent of man, you know, from apes up and so forth. We reject evolution, but we still fall prey to that mentality. We assume that these guys were idiots, not as smart as we are. It may be the other way around. They were much closer to God. There's things they knew that we have st are still beginning to discover, not necessarily in technology, but, uh, uh, but anyway. So I'm not going to get into the ge genealogy except to say that I think we, uh, we have no, no embarrassment in just accepting them what they say. And I told you, I'm explaining the year of the flood was the year that no, no, uh, Methuselah dies, the year of the flood. But then we get to Lamech. Now here's what root that we have that's still in our language today, a lament or lamentation. It means, the root means despairing. I think it echoes what we read in chapter 4 with the, the poem that, uh, Lamech told, that, that the Lamech of Cain uh, read to his wives. Lamech, this Lamech, uh, lived 182 years, begot a son, and called his name Noah, saying, This same shall comfort us. What does the word Noah mean? You can tell from this verse. It means comfort or rest. Okay? So it's, designed, it's, it's from Nacham, which means to bring relief or comfort. Comfort or rest. So now you say, gee, Chuck, you've given us a lot of dry vocabulary work here. Why? Well, we have a genealogy in Genesis 5 that's not translated in your Bible. It's transliterated. Adam, Seth, Enosh, Kenan, Nahalel, Yared, Enoch, Methuselah, Lamech, and Noah. Knowing what we now know, having explored the roots and the meaning of these words as revealed in the Scripture, um, oh, I forgot to mention, I, mean, I think I slipped by Kenan, by the way. Kenan, uh, Kenites, is, uh, when Balaam at, in Numbers was looking over, he made a pun on the Kenites. So we, we know some of this from the Scripture. I may have missed that. Anyway, Adam means man, right? Seth means appointed. Man is appointed mortal sorrow. But the blessed God shall come down teaching that his death shall bring. Whose death? God's death shall bring the despairing comfort or rest. Man is appointed mortal sorrow. But the blessed God shall come down teaching that his death shall bring the despairing comfort or rest. If these words in any other order, it wouldn't make sense. And here it is a summary of the Christian gospel tucked away here in the Torah in chapter 5. Now, there's no, this has a lot of implications. First of all, there's no way you'll ever convince me that a group of Jewish rabbis contrived to hide a summary of the Christian gospel in a genealogy within their highly venerated Torah, the books of Moses. No way. No way. 
and many will quibble, quibble that some of these roots could mean something else. And fine, if the, uh, uh, from my point of view, it's like you're, 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 you're in an ancient garden. You push through the ivy, there's a wall, and there's a door in the wall. And down in the ivy, you find a key. You can argue all day whether that key works the door. These are ways to put it in the door and see if it opens the door. If it opens the door, it's the key to the door. <laughs> so that's the way I regard this. Okay, anyway. Um, but there's another implication here, too. And that is that God's plan of redemption was not a knee-jerk reaction to the surprise that Adam blew it. When did God first start dealing with you? Ephesians 1.4 tells you before the foundation of the world, God had you on his mind. And God laid out, knew that Adam would get us all in a predicament that nothing less than the death of God would prevail to get us out of this predicament. And yet he went forward in this as a demonstration of just how much a God can love. We talk about infinite power, infinite knowledge, all these infinitudes about God. How do you demonstrate infinite love? Jesus told us. Greater love has no man than he that lays down his life for his friends. Jesus Christ willingly went to the cross for you and me. One integrated design. The New Testament is in the Old Testament concealed. The Old Testament is in the New Testament revealed.